It's May 13, 1982. South Philadelphia has become the battlefield to a brutal street war between two warring factions of the Philadelphia Mafia family, one led by family boss Little Nicky Scarfo and the other by family captain Hunchback Ricobane. Ricobane wanted to seize control of the family from the current murderous boss, and as a result, Scarfo would respond with a swift and violent murder campaign. Over 12 men have died across the past two years of gang chaos as a result of inter-family mutiny. That fateful day, a group of Ricobene gangsters would position a sniper near family consigliere Frank Monti. Monti was a vicious gangster who'd worked his way to the top and became Scarfo's second-in-command. The gunmen would put the mafioso in their sights and open fire. Federal drug agents in Philadelphia moved with speed to round up a network that allegedly dealt in speed. Methamphetamine. A former number two man under one time mob boss Joey Merlino. The zone is now reported to be the acting boss in the wake of those recent For decades. What's different about this one, though, is that the battlefield has changed. The shootings have been out of the open in public places, like the South Philadelphia landmark. It's July 7, 1891. Salvatore Sabella is born into a Castellamorese family in Sicily. He begins a brief apprenticeship under a butcher in his town, but as a result, becomes the subject of the butcher's violent outbursts. Becoming increasingly fed up with his boss's anger issues, in 1905, at the young age of 14, Sabella would murder the butcher. He was caught shortly afterwards and sentenced to three years behind bars, getting sent up to a prison in Milan. While there, the young Sabella would become connected with members of the Sicilian Mafia, and shortly following his release from custody, took his criminal background with him to New York as an illegal immigrant. In 1912, Sabella arrived at Ellis Island, and after settling in Brooklyn, became a member of the Daquila crime family. The family was led by Salvatore Daquila, a Sicilian immigrant who'd originally joined the Morello crime family, led by their namesake founder, Giuseppe Morello. However, in 1910, Morello went behind bars, and Daquila split off to begin his own gang, which expanded into Manhattan. After joining the organization, Sabella went under the wing of Giuseppe Trena, who took him as an apprentice. In 1919, the boss sent Sabella to Philadelphia to establish a branch of the Castellamorese clan in the still uncontrolled territory. After arriving in town, he would open up an Italian olive oil business as well as a soda bar in order to have a legal cover-up for his criminal activities. While in Philly, Sabella himself would take John Avina as his apprentice and train the man to run the family if he ever went away. The gang operated in the standard crime rackets of extortion, gaming, and bootlegging, which made Sabella a rich man. On August 22nd, 1925, local bootlegger Leo Lanzetta was gunned down at a barber shop. Lanzetta, born in 1895, was a member of the Lanzetta Brothers Gang, a drug and alcohol trafficking syndicate made up of six brothers. Leo was the oldest of the gang and the original founder. The men operated out of Philadelphia's Little Italy neighborhood, moving their product throughout the city. Their operation was actually a very unique one. The brothers would go to row homes and offer their residents with home distilleries payment in exchange for them producing liquor. The Lanzetta gangsters would then resell the liquor at high prices, and throughout the Prohibition era, they became known for their effective business and violent tactics, many of them being in and out of jail. The Lanzetta clan worked with two known gangsters at the time, Michael Falcone and Louis Del Rossi, and grew to have a long list of rivals over the years, including men like Max Hoff and Sabella's Mafia clan. 
On August 18, 1925, Joe Bruno, a made man under Sibella's family and a rival drug peddler, was whacked out by Leo and his brother Ignatius. As revenge for the murder, on the afternoon of August 22, 1925, a Sibella gunman walked up to Leo as he exited a barber shop and blew him down. Immediately, suspicion fell on Sibella's shoulders, and the state began their first attempts at prosecuting him. In 1927, two members of his mafia family, Vincent Kokotza and Joseph Zangi, turned on the boss and formed a rebellious faction. In May, both men were gunned down on a street corner in town. Anthony Zangi, the brother of Joseph, immediately flipped to the state and provided the officers with enough information to charge the boss. Police took Sibella in, but shortly afterwards, he was acquitted. This, however, wasn't the end of his problems. After opening up Sabella's file, authorities would find some damning evidence against the crime boss. They discovered that he was living in the US as an illegal immigrant the entire time, and at the end of 1927, Sabella was deported back home. Avina would then become the acting boss. Shortly after Sabella's departure, a brutal conflict would explode in New York between two Sicilian Mafia factions, one being the Castellamorese clan, led by Salvatore Maranzano. Maranzano fought against Giuseppe Masseria, a rival boss in the city. The warfare also affected the Philadelphia family as well. On October 10, 1928, while walking along a street in Manhattan, Salvatore Dequila was gunned down by rival hitmen. His second-in-command, Manfredi Mineo, would take over the family afterwards. On November 5th of 1930, while standing in the courtyard of his Bronx apartment building, Mineo and his top lieutenant, Steve Ferrigno, were both gunned down by Maranzano hitmen. The hitmen had initially intended to murder Giuseppe Masseria, but ended up going for Mineo since he was already there. In 1929, Sibella returned to the US and settled back in New York, alongside nine gunmen to help Maranzano's clan win the war, since both Maranzano and Sabella were Castellamorese. On April 15, 1931, Masseria was murdered in an act of sabotage by his own men, finally ending the warfare, and Sabella resumed his place as the king of Philadelphia's criminal underworld. In 1931, a 40-year-old Sibella would be arrested for assault and ultimately decided his best course of action was to simply retire. He stepped down from his post and handed the role over to Avina, now permanently. Sibella moved all the way out to Norristown, where he led the rest of his life as a local butcher. Avina was born in 1893 in Sicily. With time, he'd become one of Sibella's highest-ranking lieutenants, and would lead the family past the slow decline of the Prohibition era. He worked with the local Jewish Mafia clan, known as the 69th Street Mob, to establish new rackets in a post-Prohibition society. However, his appointment as boss didn't go unchallenged, and an armed conflict would break out between the new captain and other gangs in Philadelphia. One of the men who was allegedly part of the war against the new boss was Giuseppe Dovi, a family lieutenant, although his role in the actual conflict is unknown. The five-year-long insurgency against Avina ultimately came to an end on August 17, 1936. That night, while walking with gang associate Martin Feldstein, a group of Lanzetti brothers would drive up past the men, a gunman aiming out of one of the rear windows. They gunned both gangsters down as they sped off, leaving the boss on the sidewalk. Giuseppe Dovi would then become the new boss. Dovi, only four years older than the late Avena, actually lived outside of the Philadelphia area, originally living in Bristol and later New Jersey. The Philadelphia family would expand their reach past South Philly and into the rest of the city, holding operations as well in New Jersey, namely in the Atlantic City area. 
As the family entered the 1940s, they saw a newfound fortune split amongst numerous increasingly profitable crime rackets like narcotics trading, loan sharking, and more. In 1946, a sick Dovey was admitted to the New York City Hospital, and on October 22nd, the boss passed away from health complications. With him now gone, the role of family head would be passed down to Lieutenant Giuseppe Ida. Giuseppe Ida was born on November 6, 1890, in Calabria. In 1919, a 29-year-old Ida moved to the U.S., deciding to stay in South Philly. While living in this new city, he would become connected with Salvatore Sabella and other members of his criminal organization. When Sabella was charged for murder in 1927, Ida was charged alongside him, although all the defendants were acquitted shortly afterwards. When Ida became boss, he made it his goal to spread the reach of the family and conquer the region in their name. Over the next few years, his soldiers forced other racketeers and gangs out of the area, which included the once powerful South Philly Jewish mob. Meanwhile, the organization had continued to operate as a sort of branch family for New York's Dequila family, now known as the Luciano family, and later as the Genovese family. Family underboss Vito Genovese had a strong hand over their operations, especially those in Atlantic City. However, Ida's iron fist reign over Philadelphia would come to an end in 1958, shortly after the infamous Appalachian meeting. It's 1956. Carmine Galante, a high-level member of New York's Bonanno crime family, is driving to the home of Pennsylvania Mafia boss Joseph Barbara, a massive 50-plus acre estate in Appalachian, New York. Barbara was a powerful gangster, boss of the Scranton Mafia, and he operated heavily in bootlegging. As Galante is driving to the property, he's pulled over by state troopers who discover he was driving without a license. After going through his criminal record, they decide to begin a surveillance operation of Barbara's property. It's now May 2nd of 1957. Frank Costello, the current boss of New York's powerful Luciano family, is walking up to the lobby of a Central Park apartment complex. He became the boss after founder Charles Luciano was deported to Sicily. Costello had just gotten back after having dinner with friends, and after stepping out of his taxi cab, a black Cadillac would slowly pull up behind him. Out of the Cadillac stepped a large 6'2 man, family hitman Vincent Gigante. Gigante had been sent by Genovese with the goal of whacking out Costello. As Gigante approached Costello, he shouted, quote, This is for you, Frank and opened fire. Costello stumbled into the lobby, falling on a couch, as Gigante fled the site, thinking the job was done. However, Costello had survived. During the preceding trial, the building's doorman testified that he'd seen Gigante do it. Gigante was arrested, but due to Costello claiming he had no recollection of his attacker, was let go. Ironically, the man he'd tried to kill saved him from a lengthy sentence. He was even heard thanking Frank following his acquittal. Costello decided enough was enough, getting the message. He retired from the family, leading to Genovese taking control, with original boss Luciano all the way in Italy, powerless to stop the shifting leadership. Genovese continued his power grab of the family. In October of 1957, he had Albert Anastasia, the feared boss of the Mangano family, whacked at a barber shop in Manhattan. Genovese had worked with Carlo Gambino, Anastasia's underboss, to commit the murder. As a result, Gambino would take over the Mangano family, and the name was changed to the Gambino family. In November of 1957, shortly after taking control of the Luciano family, Genovese would call for the other bosses to come to a massive meeting in Buffalo, New York, to talk about the current state of the Mafia. The meeting was initially set for Chicago, but Genovese changed his mind after speaking with Buffalo crime boss Stefano Magadino. Magadino had Barbara and his underboss Russell Buffalino set up the event. 
Officers discovered Barbara's son booking hotel rooms in the local town, while overseeing a massive shipment of meats from a butcher shop to the estate in the days leading up to the meeting. Police began to watch the home even more carefully. Then, on November 14, over 100 mafiosi met at Barbara's massive estate. As the meeting began, officers found dozens of luxury cars parked outside, and discovered that the vehicles were licensed to high-level members of known criminal organizations. They then set up a roadblock outside. One of Barbara's men, Bortolo Guccia, discovered the roadblocks while going to pick up a shipment of fish. The information was relayed to the mafiosi, who knew they were compromised. Many began to drive off, while others ran into the woods. By the end of the raid, around 60 men were in police custody, which included high-level members of the Genovese family. Two of these men were Giuseppe Aida and his underboss, Big Dom Olivetto. Olivetto retired shortly afterwards, while Aida ran back to Italy, leaving a vacancy in Philadelphia, which was then occupied by Antonio Polina. When Polina became the boss of the Philadelphia family, his first major move as boss was to plan the murder of Angelo Bruno, a high-level gangster who was a threat to his authority. Bruno, born in May of 1910, lived the first few years of his life in Villalba, Sicily. His family immigrated to the U.S. shortly after his birth, settling in South Philly. His father operated a grocery store in town, where Bruno worked until age 12, when he began attending school. He was a close friend to Carlo Gambino, and ended up dropping out of high school to operate his own grocery store, while also working as a gangster on the side. Eventually, Bruno was inducted into the Philadelphia family, after getting sponsored by Michael Maggio. In 1928, Bruno got his first arrest after being caught recklessly driving, and over the next few years was in and out of jail for bootlegging, gambling, theft, and more. As his career grew in the family, so too did Polina's fear. Polina ultimately decided to whack out the man and save himself the headache. He went to his underboss, Ignazio Denaro, and ordered the man to clip Bruno. Denaro then approached Bruno and exposed the plot. He knew Bruno was a more connected man due to his friendship with Gambino and went with the winning party. Bruno informed the commission, who forced Polina to give up his job. Denaro, of course, kept his role as underboss. Bruno was given the okay to murder his enemy, but ultimately decided it wasn't necessary. This was an early sign of how his reign as boss was going to look. Bruno was known to be a diplomatic gangster. He'd seen the outbursts of violence and murder that had caused issues for the other gang organizations around him, and tried his best to avoid them. Violence brought too much attention, and caused too much mutiny. He kept his family off the police radar due to this, and acting as a businessman more than a gangster, ended most conflicts through negotiation and communication, rather than violence and anger. This eventually got him the nickname, The Gentle Dawn. Think about me. As boss, Bruno stuck to traditional mafia rackets like loan sharking and extortion, and had a big influence in union racketeering. He didn't permit narcotics dealing amongst his family, but did however allow other Philadelphia gangs to sell drugs, so long as they kicked up a tribute to him. However, this policy angered some of his mafiosi, who wanted their taste of the drug profits. In 1963, U.S. President John F. Kennedy was assassinated. Suspicion immediately fell on Bruno's organization, as well as the Chicago outfit. Both families held major stakes in Cuba, which they banked on Kennedy to liberate from the newly founded Castro regime. However, when Kennedy's operations in Cuba failed, Bruno was caught expressing his desire for the president's murder. However, he, alongside the men in Chicago, were never convicted. In the latter 60s, Bruno's family intimidated Local 54, a chapter of the Hotel Employees and Restaurant Employees Union, into falling under their control. They then ran the union's funds dry, and stole as much as they could. By this point in time, the Philadelphia Mafia, which held a hand in numerous legitimate operations, was now known as the Bruno family. 
In 1970, Bruno got a two-year-long sentence, the longest one he would ever receive, after refusing to testify in front of an organized crime hearing. Following his release, he fled to Italy as the smoke cleared. While there, the rebellion in his family continued to grow, and in 1976, Carlo Gambino would pass away from a heart attack while at home. His strongest connection to New York was now dead, and he had become more vulnerable than ever. However, he returned home in 1977 to oversee the burgeoning operations in Atlantic City. As the family entered the mid-1970s, their operations out in Atlantic City were becoming stronger than ever. In 76, the city legalized gambling, a bill that followed a failed vote to legalize the practice statewide a year prior. When the prior bill failed, it was proposed that gambling be kept to one region, Atlantic City. As a result, the territory had seen a new wave of casinos in construction that brought Bruno millions. He took a hard line on the city after the New York bosses tried to take a cut of it, solidifying it as his territory and no one else's. However, it didn't matter, as only a few years after his return, Bruno's story would come to a violent end. The year is 1912. Antonio Bananas Caponegro is born in Chicago. He got his nickname from his father's line of work as a successful banana merchant at the Italian market in Philadelphia. Caponegro was made at some point in the 1950s, now becoming an official member of the Philadelphia crime family. With time, he found himself working in the ironbound neighborhood of Newark, New Jersey part of the family's territory. From there, he ran his operations under Captain Ricardo Biondi. In the 1970s, Caponegro became the family's consigliere and began to watch the downfall of Bruno's reign. Bruno was a sick man due to his old age and was under heavy stress due to his indictments. He had no truly feared loyalists around him, and when Gambino died in 1976, Caponegro saw an opening to take over and expand the family into the drug trade. In 1980, Capo Negro drove to New York City to talk with Frank Thierry, the frontman boss of the Genovese crime family. Thierry had become the acting boss in 1972 when Thomas Eboli was murdered by the Gambino family who wanted Thierry in his place. The fateful night of his death, July 16, 1972, Eboli was gunned down while sitting in a car outside his girlfriend's home in Brooklyn, and Thierry would take his place. Thierry was a quiet man who kept the peace within the family. He was openly generous with his soldiers and shared the profits he made, which kept the men happy. Due to both his smarts in business and the street, he avoided jail time for almost his entire life and like Angelo Bruno, stayed away from violence unless necessary. Thierry wanted Bruno's North Jersey gambling rackets, and decided to dupe Caponegro. He told the man that he had the commission's support in the murder, and Caponegro flew back to South Philly with a newfound confidence and assurance. He worked with numerous mutinous men, including his brother-in-law Alfred Salerno, family loan shark Frank Sindone, and Bruno's cousin John Simone. Thierry knew the men would be, in the best case, exiled, and the worst case, murdered, and this would give him an opening to get involved in the family's operations. On March 21st, 1980, Bruno sat in his sedan outside his home in South Philly. He sat adjacent to his driver, John Stanfa, a New York gangster who'd been sent down to Philadelphia in the 1960s. That night, a hitman walked by the sedan with a shotgun and opened fire. This is where our story ends. Stanfa suffered from major injuries, while Bruno slumped over in his chair, his face disfigured. He was dead, and Caponegro was the new boss of Philadelphia. That victory was short-lived, however. In April of 1980, he was summoned to a commission meeting, 
where he was told that no one had even known about the plan. He panically turned to Thierry, who denied any involvement. On the night of April 18, Caponegro was found dead in his car trunk, naked, his body riddled with bullets and dollar bills shoved down his throat to signify his greed. His brother-in-law was found dead in the same car, while the rest of his co-conspirators were murdered over the next few days. After his death, a new family boss was named, Philip Chicken Man Testa. was very astute in recognizing he might as well give them permission, these other families, to come in rather than risk the incurred wrath and the resulting gang warfare or merely these other mobs muscling in. So he declared Atlantic City an open city. That certainly created a backlash within the members of his own mob, which contributed to his eventual assassination. Shortly after Bruno's murder, his driver, John Stanfa, testified before a grand jury regarding that infamous night and shortly afterwards went on the run. He had lied during his testimony. In December of 1980, he was caught hiding out as a baker in Baltimore and was charged in Philadelphia for perjury. In 1981, he received a massive eight-year-long sentence and would stay out of the picture for the next few years. With both Bruno and Caponegro gone, Philip Testa would become the new boss of the family. Testa was born in April of 1924 into a Sicilian immigrant family in South Philly. In his teenage years, he'd become close friends with Angelo Bruno, which aided his rise in the family later on. He listed his illegal income as gambling winnings and never reported a legitimate income like many of his associates. In 1970, Testa was named family underboss, and a decade later, the official boss. However, Testa would see a similar violent fate as his predecessor. On March 15, 1981, while returning home, he stepped onto his front porch, which erupted under him. He instantly died from his wounds, and it was discovered that a nail bomb had been planted before his return home. The plot against his life had been planned out by underboss Peter Casella, who had been placed in the position by Testa. Casella worked with Captain Frank Narducci Sr., as both men felt underappreciated by the new boss. They were part of a growingly mutinous faction in the family, but they were a minority. On the evening of January 27, 1982, while walking out of court, a family hitman would gun Narducci down. Casella, fearing for his life, fled to Florida after being exiled from the Mafia. And with Testa's death, the Second Philadelphia War was kicked off. The war was a violent four-year-long period, which saw over 20 gangland murders as a result. In 1981, as part of the war, the top position of the Philadelphia hierarchy was viciously seized by Chicken Man's old consigliere, a short but brutal gangster named Nicodemo Scarfo. It's March 8, 1929 in Brooklyn. Catherine Scarfo gives birth to her son, Nicodemo. She and her husband, Philip, were immigrants from Calabria and Naples, respectively. They settled in Brooklyn after coming to the US, but when Scarfo was 12, his family would settle in South Philly. He was a rare case of a mafioso actually graduating high school, and shortly after his graduation, he would get a job as a train station newsboy. To make extra cash on the side, Scarfo got a job as an amateur boxer. Although only sitting at 5'5", he was known as a brutal and ill-tempered figure. Due to a variety of reasons, however, his career in boxing didn't take off, and with this initial disappointment, Scarfo decided to search for a new form of employment, illegal work under his uncle, Nicky Buck. Buck was a soldier under Philadelphia boss Giuseppe Ida, and while working as a young apprentice under Buck, focusing on bookmaking, Scarfo worked as a bartender at another one of his uncle's clubs. In 1954, one of his uncles sponsored him for membership into the family, and as such, Ida made Scarfo, while two of his uncles became soldiers under him. Scarfo was a close friend to Philip Testa, his gangland mentor, following his rise in the family. When Ida moved to Italy, Bruno became the new boss, and he was forced to handle the burden of Scarfo's rage. In 1962, Scarfo was ordered to murder Dominic Caruso, a family gangster who'd gotten into conflict with Joe Rugnetta. Rugnetta was, at the time, the family's consigliere and leader of the South Philly Calabrian faction. 
On one January 1962 night, however, while arguing with Rognetto, Caruso would slap the man in the face. Bruno then sanctioned his murder. On January 30, Scarfo gunned Caruso down. Scarfo, although loyal, was a stubborn and violent man who came into conflict with many other gangsters. In one 1963 case, he declined to marry Rognetta's daughter, which caused tension to form between the two men. That same year, Scarfo pleaded guilty to the stabbing of South Philly stevedore William Dugan. That night, Scarfo had begun arguing in a diner over which booth to sit in, which caused him to stab the civilian. Bruno had become exhausted by the young gangster's cowboy style, and, sticking to his generally diplomatic nature, exiled Scarfo to the then backwater region of Atlantic City. This was, of course, over a decade before the city would grow into a gambling paradise, and although Scarfo was in charge of the city, it was a glorified exile. Have you ever been convicted of a crime? I invoke my right under the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution and decline to answer the question. It's 1971. Nicodemus Scarfo is the current captain of Atlantic City, a New Jersey territory controlled by Philadelphia Mafia boss Angelo Bruno. That year, Scarfo was called to testify in front of the New Jersey SCI, which had been established only two years prior. However, he refused to testify and got jail time instead. Over the next few years, Scarfo sat behind bars, serving time alongside Bruno, who had been arrested around the same time. He also sat with two Genovese family members, as the Philadelphia family was a branch of the Genovese. These men were Gerardo Catena and Louis Mana. Catena was a high-ranking member of the family and one of the richest Italian mafiosi in American history. Mana was the Genovese consigliere, and while in jail with Scarfo, the two men would become close friends. After stepping out of jail in 1973, the young gangster continued his operations in Atlantic City until 1976, when he would see his major break. Following the legalization of gambling in the region, Scarfo's pockets would boom even more than the city. He and his nephew, Phil Leonetti, would begin a contracting company named Scarf Inc., their logo being an actual scarf. And the men used intimidation to pour concrete for casinos across the city's major shoreline. In 1976, Leonetti was sent with Vincent Falcone to whack out Louis DeMarco, a Philadelphia junkie who had robbed a member of the family at gunpoint. As DeMarco walked into the parking lot of his residential building, Leonetti tagged behind him and gunned him down. Shortly after the murder, Falcone would make an insulting remark regarding Scarfo, and this insult wouldn't be forgotten. In 1978, Scarfo and family hitman Nick Virgilio would drive into Ducktown, Atlantic City's Italian neighborhood, searching for city judge Edwin Helfant. The gangsters had recently bribed Helfant to support them in court during a murder trial, and he accepted their bribe. However, in a confusing turn of events, he turned on the men and refused to follow through with his part of the deal. That night, Scarfo drove up to a restaurant in Ducktown where Helfant was eating, and Virgilio walked into the establishment. He gunned the judge down, ran back into the car, and Scarfo sped off. This was only one of many murders to come, however. In 1979, Scarfo had Leonetti whack Falcone. That night, Leonetti lured Falcone to a mob gathering in New Jersey and asked the man to make the gangsters some drinks. While standing in the kitchen, Leonetti approached him and shot him twice. In 1980, Leonetti became a made man, and his finances grew exponentially due to his many Atlantic City rackets. 
He was Scarfo's biggest protege, and the man was training him to be just like him. When Testa became family boss, he appointed Scarfo as the family's consigliere, which would lead to his and Leonetti's rise to power shortly afterwards. Then, in 1981, he became the new boss. He made Salvatore Merlino his new underboss, and Frank Monti his consigliere. Merlino was born in 1939 into an Italian family in Ducktown. He had been with Scarfo since the beginning, and had been charged with him back in the 1963 stabbing. In 1980, Merlino and his brothers were inducted into the family, becoming made men under Philip Testa. When Scarfo took over, he gave Merlino a top spot in the family. Monty's story was similar, as he too was part of Scarfo's close clique of violent men, and as such was given an administrative role in the organization. Meanwhile, many of the old captains were demoted under the new regime, while Phil Leonetti was promoted. He rose up in the family hierarchy alongside Merlino's brother and Scarfo's friend Joseph Ciancalini Sr. Scarfo began to accumulate a reputation as a paranoid and murderous leader. As soon as he took charge, he began to push his soldiers to engage in more levels of violence. Street violence unseen in the city beforehand. He had opponents murdered in broad daylight to scare the authorities and send a clear-cut message to the others working under him. However, between August of 1982 and January of 1984, Scarfo sat behind bars for illegal gun possession. He had two Mexican cartel members guard him at all times, likely due to his smaller size. While Scarfo was imprisoned, family member Harry Ricobene began to form a mutinous clan in the family out of opposition to the boss, and things went south. Harry Ricobene was an older gangster who'd been around since the Prohibition era, serving as a soldier under gang founder Salvatore Sabella all the way back in 1927. He had witnessed every era of violence that plagued South Philly, which earned him heavy respect by his associates, who saw him as a true-to-the-core mafioso. Meanwhile, Rico Bene knew what putting a brutal, greedy, and irrational man like Scarfo as leader would entail. As such, he began to lead a faction of the family that stood against the new boss. He began his opposition by refusing to pay any tribute to the new regime. Under Bruno, Rico Bene and the other gangsters were never ordered to pay a recurring share of the money they made. Although extortion of mafiosi is one of the most normal American mafia practices, Philadelphia was unique in that it was uncommon. However, Scarfo, wanting to turn the South Philly Mafia into a powerful and feared enterprise, demanded the men kick up to him, which enraged Rico Benne. Scarfo had the street tax enforced by his soldiers, who viciously beat down any signs of mutiny. Meanwhile, Scarfo seized the South Philly meth trade from Greek mobster Kelsayas Buras. Buras was the boss of the city's Greek crime syndicate and had made a fortune off of methamphetamine trafficking. He'd been a longtime ally to the Mafia and worked closely with many of them. However, he refused to kick up to Scarfo for operating in his territory, and as such, the enraged boss took this move as a sign of disrespect. On May 27, 1981, Buras and his girlfriend sat down to eat dinner with Scarfo soldier Raymond Maturano. As they ate, a hit team entered the restaurant and motioned for Maturano to move out of the way. They gunned the gangster and his woman down, wounding the Italian in the process. It was believed that Maturano was a sort of distraction used by the Italians to lure Buras to the restaurant. The Italians then seized the P2P trade in the region, which they used to control the greater meth trade. One of the biggest names in this new drug operation was Maturano's son, George who with time would build up a drug empire worth over $75 million. Meanwhile, the conflict between Scarfo and Ricobene became uncontrollable. 
Frank Monty would approach Rico Bene's brother Mario and demand the man whack out the rebellious captain. Mario then went to Rico Bene and told him all about the murder plot, and he decided to strike first. On May 13, 1982, Mario and two other Rico Bene gangsters, Joseph Padula and Victor De Luca, parked a van nearby Monty's Cadillac sedan. They positioned a sniper on the sedan and sat waiting. Monty then stepped out of the car, and Padula fired three times, the consigliere falling to the ground. In June, Rico Bene was seen standing in a phone booth, talking to his girlfriend over the phone. Scarfo gunman Salvatore Grande walked up to the gang captain and opened fire on him five times. A wounded Rico Bene managed to wrestle the gun away as Grande ran off. When police found him bleeding out on the sidewalk, he of course refused to talk. He then began a slow recovery. In July, Padula and DeLuca were out cruising the road when they spotted Salvatore Testa standing outside a pizza place. Testa was the son of Philip the Chicken Man and was a high-ranking and loyal member of Scarfo's crew. They opened fire, Testa falling to the ground, but he somehow managed to survive the shooting as the hitmen sped off. In August, while sitting in his car, a gunman would approach Rico Bene and empty a magazine on him. Not a single bullet hit the mafioso. The war began to see its end when Mario and Harry were arrested for Monty's murder. The men sat behind bars, although now safe from the bloodshed, they were unable to participate and their family suffered major losses. On April 29, 1983, Pascale Spirito was murdered in his car. Spirito was a made man under the family and was initially a friend to Rico Bene and Mario. When the war kicked off, however, he aligned himself with the leadership regime. He was approached with a contract to murder Robert Rico Bene, one of Rico Bene's brothers, but messed it up. This, alongside numerous other behavioral patterns, led to Spirito's death. His major issue was that he was a lazy man, and he didn't have the killer instinct that Scarfo saw as necessary to conquer Philadelphia and plant his flag in Cosa Nostra. On November 3rd, 1983, Samuel Tamburino was killed. Tamburino was a member of Rico Bene's faction and ran a variety store in southwest Philly. That day, Philip Leonetti sent down a hit crew who ambushed Tamburino in the store and murdered him in front of his mother. On December 6, 1983, Robert Rico Bene drove up to his mother's house in South Philly, her sitting next to him. He got out of the car and began walking her to the door before spotting Francis Iannarella, a Scarfo hitman who walked up to the pair with a sawed-off shotgun. Rico Bene went running while the hitman opened fire, killing him. His mother tried to get Iannarella to stop, who responded by smacking her with his rifle and taking off. On December 14, Mario's 27-year-old son Enrico would kill himself. He had no connection to the gang war and was a normal citizen. However, he had heard that Scarfo's gang were after him and became too afraid to handle it. Salvatore Testa mockingly exclaimed that the Scarfo's rivals were so afraid of them that they did the job for them. With the Rico Bene leaders behind bars and the rest of their faction all wiped out, the wave of brutality was now over. Mario became incredibly sad by the death of his family and flipped to the feds. He pleaded guilty to third degree and Harry Rico Bene got life behind bars as a result. And that final move confirmed Scarfo's position as the violent, uncontrollable boss of Philadelphia.